I had known him for many, 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 many years. Back when his kids were like, their his kids are in college now. And that really bothers me. Right? Senior, almost in college, and that really bothers me. That's how long I've known this guy. Um, he, he he often actually introduces me. That's you know we're we're, we're, uh, we're in a really good relationship. He's the type of person when I text him some like life news, he'll call me to thank me to talk to me about it, which is like really super sweet. And I just think that really speaks to who he is. That he'll call you. Like he doesn't text you back. Congratulations. Like he'll call and like, hey, what's going on? And I really love that about him. Um, so that's my fun fact for him, that he's a sweet guy who like, who, who cares about you. So with that, please, Mark, come on down. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Weissman. Uh, thank you, Jared, for the kind introduction. Uh, we, we, you know, we've known each other for a long time and obviously we try to, you know, make, make as much fun as we can to each other with, and, and being respectful about it. Uh, so I am here today to talk to you about, um, couple of things that I'd love for you to think about um, as you are going into your R journey. So, I mean, I hope, probably, I think everyone in this room is an R user. I'm sure everyone in this room uses other tools as well. So uh, the idea here really uh, spawned from many, many things, and I'll get to that in a second. But the, the, the idea here is moving from this, right, from your laptop or your workstation or wherever it is that you're doing your work into a production environment. And I'm using air quotes because production can mean many things. Uh, I'd like to do a quick, uh, just sort of a survey here. So have, who's written, have, who's ever written an R script to be run in a non-interactive way? Raise your hand. Okay, so actually a good number of you. Good, good, good. Did it work the first time as planned? Raise your hand if it did. <laughs> Asme, good for you. <laughs> Have you ever scheduled an R script to run without human intervention? Okay, all right. So we're we're. I thought we'd be. I thought we'd be worse, but good. This is great, actually. Um, raise your hand if you actually have an R script running in production right now. Okay, very few shoot hands. <laughs> so why? Uh, well, we won't get into the why uh, because that's a really complex thing, and I only have eighteen minutes left. So um, we're back. This was 2019, and uh, my walk-up song was a, uh, a klezmer song. And I came and I even did an impromptu horror with Jared, but we'll leave it at that. Um, who am I? Uh, again, I work for Microsoft. I am a senior cloud solutions architect, been at Microsoft for five years. Uh, I was working mostly with federal customers. I, I switched to a different, uh, different industry, so working with financial customers in the financial services industry. I help customers use Azure for data science, machine learning, analytics uh, workflows. Right now I'm doing a stint in the Azure machine learning product team, which has been really cool. So I'm working within the, the, the PM program management, product management that I don't know what the P really stands for, but uh, it's been really great. And I'm going back into the field at the end of the month, at the end of the year. So uh, again, I teach here at Georgetown. So a couple of my fellow colleagues are here. Uh, fellow students, I'm not going to call anyone out. Hi, Zef. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, co-founder of Data Community DC. You know, I used to like our like Jared runs the R Meetup in New York. Uh, I used to do that here with Abhijit and a bunch of other folks for a long, long time. Uh, you know, life gets in the way. Uh, move on to other things. Uh, we're trying. I'm talking to Alex about maybe restarting, kind of having events, and just we want new blood. We want folks to come and volunteer and maybe help us like rekindle it because. Frankly, like to me, the meetup was sort of what really brought me into the R world. Uh, that's where I met Jared. That's where I got into data science. Uh, that's when I learned about big data. I, I, it, it, it's been just phenomenal. So um, that, ah, the inspiration for today. So I'm doing the, the work I'm doing right now within the Azure machine product. So interestingly, the work I'm doing within the Azure machine learning product team is working on making or on improving our documentation and um, examples for R, specifically for R. A lot of customers are asking for it. Um, anyone here ever use Azure Machine Learning, just out of curiosity? No one, wow, okay, eh, all right, we can talk later. Um, anyway, the idea is we're, we're just revamping that, and I'm actually working on that. So as I was thinking about this, and also, also over the years of me teaching, I teach a big data class, which you really need to figure out how to you know, interface with systems and stuff like that. That's sort of the inspiration for this talk. So. Our work has changed, right? As data scientists, when we talked about data science 10 years ago, 
we talked about the famous Drew Conway Venn diagram, right? Who's, I'm sure you've all seen this before, yeah? So in this context, really, it was more about perhaps machine learning, like building a model, like figuring out what was going on with your data, that sort of thing. The world has changed. We, we live in this world now. And as you've seen from the previous talks today, everyone is talking about production, everyone's talking about Docker, everyone's talking about uh, um, document building. You know, it's a team thing. You don't work in a silo. You may, if you're in a basement somewhere, but you don't, right? I mean, you are part of a team. Uh, what tasks within data science you're doing, I mean, that can be a whole day discussion, so I'm not gonna get into it. But the point is, if you wanna live in this world, you have to think differently about your code. Let's not even get into MLOps. This is the conceptual model for MLOps, <laughs> which is abstracted by a lot of the different platforms. The point is, what I'm gonna talk about today, I think is really, really important because of the things I've said before. Number one, I think it'll make you a better programmer, right? Number two, it just, it, it will make, again, well, your code will be better, but you will just learn how to think more strategically about the work that you're doing and how it moves on. You, you don't live in a vacuum, I, hopefully not. Um, but the work that you're doing as a data scientist, so let's say you're building a model, right? But that model is a scoring model for some sort of application. Well, that model needs to live somewhere, has to go somewhere, and it's part of, it's a cog. At the end of the day, uh, what we do in data science are just different cogs of a big machine. Yeah? Everyone agree with me? Good. So, but it's really, really important. What is production? Again, air quotes. Anyone know where this is from? Raise your hand if you know what this is. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, only a few. So this is, this is a famous scene from the I Love Lucy show <laughs> where they, <laughs> they're working as factory workers and they, uh, instead of packing chocolates, they're actually eating it. It's hilarious. Uh, so but again, what is production? Production really is different things to different people. Um, so let's look at this, right? I, and I'm glad many of you have scripts working in production, but you know, let's think back of that scenario where you say, okay, I'm trying to run this and it didn't work the first time. So I have a super, super duper important business stuff, whatever script that I wrote, right? In my on our studio or visual studio or whatever you use. And then I go and I run it from the command line and then ah, you get an error. Yeah? Or maybe you get another error. I mean, these are typical R errors, right? There's nothing sort of glaring about this. I mean, if you've used R, you know it's an R error. You kind of go and think debug it, but it's not very descriptive, right? If you try to run this into production and some like some orchestrator calls this, it will error and it won't run. So what happened? You don't know. But this is just one aspect of going into production. And again, what is production? Production really is different things to different people. What do you need? So when you think about the code, especially as you're thinking about moving into production, Jared, I think Jared hit, Jared talked about a whole side of production that is just even beyond the scope of what I'm talking about. But production just means running a script in a non, in a, in a automated way, like without human intervention. And that will run probably somewhere else. And to be able to do that successfully, right? And to avoid errors, you have to sort of think beyond many scopes. So you have to think about logging, you have to think about error handling, so try catch. You have to think about replicable environments, so uh, packages, your libraries, like things that you package in Docker, credentials, uh, logging with interpretable messages, right? Like kind of error messages that make sense. Parametrized scripts, which is what I'm gonna focus on in a few minutes. Metadata, right? And then obviously network and security, which is, is part of the whole stack, but I mean, obviously we're not, we're not even gonna go there right now, but. Um, you know, really, if you're going to run R and R script in sort of a scheduled, triggered, deployed somewhere else in a remote server, you need to think about ways and strategies to write your R code in production. So I talked about a couple of things, but what about the code itself? Right? What do we do about the code? So you have many options here to the rescue. World Cup fans in here? Okay. <laughs> so there you go. Um, what's the score? Who's playing today? I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to just very at a very high level talk about these uh these these two, two techniques one um one's called functional programming raise your hand if you've heard of of that term before okay so most of you have what about meta programming okay so great so awesome and then obviously dry which is sort of a mix of both and it's not really either but um well good news you probably have been doing both of these in r without really knowing that you were doing it now i'm not going to get into the 
the um, foundational aspects of what function, like true functional programming is and what, because there are many uh, like computer, com, you know, programming languages that, that, that do that. The thing with R is R is sort of, it's not a pure functional language. It's not a pure declarative. Like R is sort of multimodal and you can do all sorts of things. But if you've been using the tidyverse for, for a good amount of time, which I'm pretty sure, every, I don't know, most everyone in here is, I think. I don't know, raise your hand if you are. Okay, most of you. Um, the tidyverse just gives you a lot of these tools already in, but I'm gonna just give you a refresher of what these are, just so that, or at least mention what they are, and just so that you understand how to think about your code as you're doing this. So again, two ideas, right? Functional programming and metaprogramming. And if you go to Hadley's Advanced R on the website, I forgot to put in the URL, there actually are chapters on this. There's a whole slew of resources. Um, I actually have been reading a really good book. Uh, it's called Grokking Functional Programming. It's a Manning book. Um, it's, the examples are in Scala, uh, which is a, probably a pure functional language than R is in that sense. But um, I think from a conceptual standpoint, it, it's just a really, it's a really good read. Um, so functional programming, what is functional programming? So it's really, it's a combination of things. It's, it's a way of writing code. It's, uh, it's, a, oh, oh, it, it, it's a paradigm, right? It, I, I don't think there is like functional programming and like pure or true functional programming. I'm just gonna keep it at a higher level. Sort of let's talk about this in the R sense. Some of what we do when we do tidyverse, right? Um, especially what like metaprogramming or because R has what's called non-standard uh, non evaluation, like all of that allows it to do, you can do functional programming much easier, also metaprogramming much easier. But it, this comes from lambda, the idea of functional comes from functions, right? From lambda calculus. So the idea that you have a function, some black box in the middle, you give it an input, you get an output. If you give it the same input, you should get the same output. You should not get different outputs, right? We don't wanna do this. You know, we don't wanna, we don't wanna do the same thing over and over again and expect different results, right? Good. Um, so here are just three different, kind of quickly, uh, three, Ideally, pure functions, and I'm using pure in quotes, again, because I think it depends on the context. But um, so the first one, adding two integers, function A, and I have this function called add, function A, B, A plus B. The second character, the second one, find the first character. I give it a string, uh, and I substring, right, S11. This is actually R code. And then the last one is divide two integers. So the tenets of pure functions, so functional programming uh, goes with the idea of using what's called pure functions, which is A function should return a single value. A function should only use its arguments. It shouldn't use anything from your global environment, right? Everything that the function needs has to be passed into the function. And the third is that does not mutate existing values. Again, uh, that, that's a little bit more complex, but let's look at this for a second. There is one last thing. Code shouldn't lie, okay? I don't even know where this is from. I guess it's from a Disney movie, but what? Oh. God, well, okay, fine. I just gave myself away. Uh, I've seen bits and pieces of that movie, not never the whole thing. The the point I, I need to I need it's on my it's on my watch list. It's on my watch list. But guys, hey, I work, I teach, and I have a family, so my, my Netflix viewing time is limited. Um, all right, let's look at these functions again. Are these functions lying? Are they? The first one. So. Add function A and B. Now, again, I got these, I took these examples from the Grokking book, which came from Scala. Scala is a statically typed language, which means that you actually have to specify the data types going in and the data types going out. We don't do that in R. We should, right? Because that will make us better programmers, because that will ensure that the data that's going into our function is treated the right way, right? And not a character. So if I actually did add and I said three and I did well. R does a bunch of stuff for us, right? If I give it a, if I give it a, um, if I give it a real number and an integer, it will coerce everything to real, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so it does coercion for us, like implicitly. We don't have to do that. Other languages don't. We have to do that ourselves. So that's one area where R is like a little tricky. Although you can apply these ideas, R does a lot of stuff for us without us really understanding. So it's really important that when you write functions use error handling and make sure that the types do data type checks when the, your data, you know, whatever your parameters going into the function are coming in so that the function does the right way. Because if not, you're gonna get different results. And obviously you're gonna violate the whole functioning programming paradigm. So the first one, 
possibly the second one you know I, again in r if i do this and i give it a blank string if i does it give us back a string it will if i give it a blank string i get an empty string back in scala you don't you get an error and the third one here obviously if we give it an na or something we will get an error but the point is the idea is, is that there is more to meet there is more than meets the eye especially in r because of a lot of the type conversions and so coercions and other things that r does for us so as you're writing your code, make sure you know what your parameters are. Metaprogramming. Um, the definition from Wikipedia, it says it's basically a programming technique that lets be, that your data is programs that get converted into other programs. So we, we probably do a lot of that um, without even knowing. If you use, what is it, like dbplyr, like dbplyr converts dplyr code to SQL, for example, you can generate YAML, you can generate Docker. So that's just all metaprogramming, but th this is also, there's also meta in the sense of like passing parameters into your tidy, verbs. I'm not going to get into the, the, the whole thing because that's sort of a bigger thing, but we are doing that. And those two things like functional and, and metaprogramming, I think R is really flex, is really, what's the word? It's great for that. It, it's great for that. And it allows you to be a lot fle flexible with your programming, but flexibility also perhaps may introduce errors. So you have to find that balance, right, between flexibility and, and kind of writing let's call it production level code, whatever your production might be. It could be like taking it in a USB stick, doing sneaker net, right? Walking it to a, uh, a sensor out in the field that's collecting data. I don't know what production is, but it, you know, to, to each their own. So how do we prepare our, our code for production? You should, this, this is, again, this is, uh, this is sort of my opinion, but um, you should think of like take your interactive script right which typically you write and you say you know set working directory or use here or you create a path you know you create a um a project which sort of bundles everything for you but rather than using that like parameterize everything that goes into your script because that way you can call that script externally right and and send the so it's basically you take a whole level of abstraction up right your script is a function and your script takes some inputs and produces outputs ideally the same inputs will produce the same outputs so your whole script should be you know have this idea of functional programming but then you can send metadata to that script right and then you can run the same script over so example it's like say you're running a bootstrap or you're building a bunch of models for you know large data sets or a many model scenario where you have different you know thousands of different groups and you have to build you're still you're running a regression on all these different groups you can scale that out easily you just send the right you know the piece of data Right. And, and again, I'm not thinking about like you can do that on your machine, obviously, if it's if, if you have enough space and memory and all that. But if you're doing thousands or hundreds of thousands of simulations, you probably you're probably going to do this either in a cluster or in a Kubernetes or Docker environment or in an ML ops platform, whatever it is. Um, here are some packages that will help you with this. Uh, the first two are two ones that I've learned about recently, especially as I'm working on updating our, our documentation. Uh, these are just ways that we're going to show you how to take an R script and be able to run that on Azure Machine Learning, for example. So the first one is called Carrier. And Carrier, I still don't fully understand Carrier, but it basically takes, it, 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 it encapsulates a function with all of its metadata. It's not just like taking a, an object and saving it and serializing, it does a lot more so that you can replicate that elsewhere. Opt parse. Now you can, you know, R has the, um, I forget, it's like, it's the args function, which you can pass in command line scripts because typically when you run these scripts in some kind of production environment it's run via it's using r script which is the command line execution for r and you pass in parameters right to the script so our opt parse is based on the python opt parse package which allows you to you know how in python you type in like python script and then like double dash parameter you know how you yeah so it allows you to do the same thing with an r script it's actually pretty neat um qs is one i learned about recently so qs it's called quick serializing it's really, instead of using, like doing save RDS, there you use the QS because it can actually save multiple objects from your workspace into a single RDS file, and it does it very, very quickly. Vetiver, we heard some talks about Vetiver before. I'm still not fully familiar with it. I know it's MLOps-ish related. One thing I read about Vetiver, which I thought was really neat, is that Vetiver can generate a Docker file for you, and it can also generate a plumber script for you. So think of metaprogramming, right? And then YAML. So you can generate YAML because typically when you run these things in production, you're going to need some sort of YAML script, which is your job description. So you can generate that YAML with R as well. And obviously everything you do in the tidyverse, whether it's tidyverse or the, uh, the time series stuff, tidyverts and the tidy models. And I love the idea of the tidyverse because everything is a data frame or a tibble. 
And then, you know, you can use the five basic verbs of a tibble to basically manipulate everything else, which I find it extremely useful and extremely easy. And I have one minute to go. Uh, up parse. This is an example of up parse. So what you do is you, lo you load the library, you do this, this, and essentially you can actually define the uh, what, how you're done, because everything's going to come in as text, right, from the command line. So here you can actually, I mean, you could do coercion like as dot something, but this is much more flexible because you can actually, it's going to check for type as well. And then what happens is here is, this is what single script, uh, it's called data file. And the idea is that as this is, if, if this is part of my script, right, I am going to pass in the path that's going to be read in. Okay, that's just one example. And then carrier, like I said, it sort of encapsulates everything. So here, again, this is using species, right? We train, this is the model. Yeah, we're not doing the splits, whatever. But the predict, we're creating the predictor and you're creating this. So it's basically packaging all the stuff up into, into one environment. To wrap up, just to um, talk about ML, you know, why, why all this? Well, because again, I am writing examples for R in production using ML ops, right? And, and, and Azure, um, Azure Machine Learning. So ML ops is really big. And as you've seen, right, it really takes into consideration all sorts. There are many people involved in ML ops, right? People with different skills and people that are you doing different things. But this is how we, Microsoft, think about ML ops. Uh, again, you have on the left side, like kind of the data part, right? The prototyping, then the middle part is. Um, collaboration. And then the last part here on the right-hand side is actually oper operationalization. How many syllables? Seven, six, five. Uh, anyway, um, data science life cycle. I think we've all seen this. And again, you know, kind of the, there, there has been, a, there has been some talk out in the world about how we are not really supporting R. That's not true. We are. No, I'm serious. Um, we're working on it. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, these are some of the references I used for today. So that's the book I told you, Grokking Functional Programming. It's really good. This is just uh, the website that we have this uh, thing called the MLOps Technical Paper. Um, some of the R in production stuff I, uh, I saw from uh, this guy in some of his talks. There's the link. And obviously Hadley's things, uh, Advanced of Hands. So thank you very much.